Welcome to Maine Concerns, where our news team gives you a closer look at the events that happened around Maine this week. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Cindy Campbell. Today, we're going to talk about the Keep It Maine campaign. But first, the pandemic has been tough for all of us to navigate, but especially for kids and their families who've had their entire routines turned upside down. I chatted this week with Chris McLaughlin of Northern Light Acadia Hospital about how it's affecting these families' mental health and what resources are available to help them cope. So we're obviously hearing a lot about the physical risks of COVID-19, but today I want to talk more about the emotional toll specifically on families. Chris, what are you seeing? How are kids adjusting to the new normal? Yeah, it's been a very long nine months. There's no doubt about that. You know, I think kids are riding this roller coaster with the rest of us, and there's going to be some great days, and then there's going to be some not-so-great days. We are absolutely seeing, though, significant increases in anxiety, feelings of isolation and loneliness, questions about depression. For kids that had been struggling before COVID, certainly this has challenged them and has brought their struggles up a notch. But more concerning at times for myself are those kids that families, teachers, caregivers, were thinking that everything was going okay, and suddenly they're met with first-time symptoms of anxiety or depression. And that can be incredibly overwhelming for families and caregivers who have never needed to access services before. Right. I would think that. Now, thinking back to my school years, you know, I always looked forward to the social interaction, to all of my extracurricular activities. I would think that's really having an impact on kids, that they don't have that social outlet anymore. Yeah, they don't. And if they do, they have to work really hard at it. We know that remote platforms like Zoom give us oftentimes the illusion of company, the illusion of socializing, but it certainly doesn't, it doesn't fit the full bill. And kids, just like adults, are really missing the full experience of being with somebody else not limiting people to these three by five squares where we just get a little bit of what's going on or that little bit of sharing of ourselves or sharing with each other and really missing out on the physical closeness of just being together in the same space. Do you anticipate that those numbers are going to go up over the winter when kids can't go and, you know, hang out socially distanced? It's more difficult to get together. Yeah, we do. I mean, we know nationally that there's some data that suggests upwards of 60% of young people have already cited this pandemic as the cause for increased loneliness, increased isolation. We know from that national data that young people are turning towards their maladaptive coping skills. And by that, I mean looking at substances, at-risk sexual behavior, maybe some self-injurious behavior. So those coping strategies that we're working so hard to move kids and young people away from are becoming a go-to again for young people. And that's of concern. And we also know that when it's feeling like your social supports are harder to reach out to, harder to access, that can contribute to feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, which can exacerbate feelings of depression and anxiety. So what can parents and teachers do if they see a kid that they think is struggling? How can they help? So I want to reinforce over and over again for families and caregivers to trust your gut. If it feels like something might be off, honor that and check in. We want to make sure that there's really good communication between parents, caregivers, and their children so that you are providing kids a lot of opportunity to let you know how they're doing. Now, I know just as well as you know that kids can perceive this as nagging sometimes, so it might take some creativity and innovation on a caregiver's part. I suggest having kids come up with maybe a five-point scale. And they can just let you know if today's a four or if today's a two. And that just may be the totality of the conversation you want to have with them. I also like the idea of providing kids some nonverbal opportunities to check in, whether it's color coding their ball caps or their sweatshirts they're wearing or leaving stickers and post-it notes for each other. But whatever it takes, keep communication lines open. 
I really like that number scale. I mean, just passing your child in the hall and saying, hey, what's your number today? And they answer you and and at least you, you know, you haven't made them empty their soul to you, but they let you know that, hey, I'm doing okay today or maybe today's not such a great day. Well, and and it's also if parents are savvy and want to get out your own notebook, that might be information worth tracking. So if your child is always a one or a two on Monday morning, but come Wednesday, Thursdays, they're back up to fours and fives, maybe you ramp up the family support at the front end of the week. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's great. What would you say to a, a child or a teen who's struggling with feelings of isolation and doesn't know how to speak up? Kids need to know that they're not alone. The impacts of this pandemic are universal and so widespread. So we are working really hard as our other organizations around the state and around the country to make sure that there are opportunities for kids to reach out and connect on their terms. So whether it's a formal therapy or support group that they can participate on Zoom, or whether it's a text line or a warm line or or a phone number that they can call and just know that there's a neutral, safe person on the other line, on the other end of that line who's listening to them and offering validation, offering some support. And how can families get information about these resources and, and who they can reach out to? Yeah, it takes a little bit of digging. We are obviously happy and and very willing to help point caregivers and families in the right direction. So they could always reach out to us at Northern Light Acadia Hospital and our very well-trained behavioral health resource center team can help point them in some of the directions. NAMI is an organization as well here in Maine that has really worked quite hard to put some services in place. They've created names first specific to our state team text line that I hear awesome things about and I know they're getting some good utilization of that. So finding opportunities for parents to just network together and come up with either suggestions on their own or access an existing resource. Okay. So I want to turn to the other end of the family here briefly. I can't imagine being a parent of a school-aged child right now because you're juggling your job and the fact that they're doing remote learning. So you're helping with education and child care. How are parents doing right now? Oh, you know, the term I've cited for this is pandemic parenting. And it's overwhelming. It's families feeling like they're failing at everything. It's families feeling like they're not giving enough of themselves to any of the people around them that need them, whether it's work or school or your child or your partner, your extended family. And so this image I get in my head is this octopus with eight arms juggling tablets and laptops and paperwork and remote learning and trying to stay in touch with your own boss to make sure they know that you're still there and available. And you're juggling and juggling and just not feeling like you're ever catching up. It's riddled with guilt. It's riddled with resentment, not necessarily at an individual or a particular thing, but just this general sense of resentment. And I have talked with, oh, dozens and dozens of parents and caregivers over the last nine months who just are, they're tired, they're overwhelmed, and they're feeling like a complete failure. Yeah. Is this causing an increase in substance use and or domestic abuse? We know that at times of economic hardship at times of stay-at-home orders, whether it's a more regionalized crisis like Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Harvey. We know that times like that in our nation's history have brought increases of intimate partner violence. We don't necessarily have the rates for our state available right now, but we know that call volume to national and even some regional support services like domestic violence hotlines have skyrocketed over the last nine months. We know that online sales of alcohol around our country have also skyrocketed since March. So you put a couple of those unfortunate situations together and it sort of creates that powder keg situation, especially when there feels like there's no immediate accessible support. Right. So what's the answer? What would your suggestions be to a parent who's finding themselves just that octopus and they're feeling like they're just not doing anything as well as they should be or feeling overwhelmed? Yeah. Again, you're not alone. Reminding yourself that it's okay and expected to 
feel what you're feeling right now. I've been talking a lot about the grief and loss process with kids and families this last nine months or so, where we remind people that it is okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel like you're a little bit lost at sea. That's what grief and loss does to us. And as we work ourselves through that process, and as we talk with one another and have a shared language and have a shared experience that we can connect over, the more we know that we're not alone, the better off we're going to be getting through this situation right now. So don't let yourself just sit and get overwhelmed. Reach out and talk to someone, whether it's a counselor or a friend or someone. You won't have to look far to find another parent or caregiver who's completely overwhelmed and feeling like a failure right now. And so creating that little pocket of social support with your own contacts and your own friends and families list, you will get so much validation and so much support. It it may not make your work inbox get any shorter. It may not make your kid get straight A's on their remote learning. It may not make the housework and the piles of dishes and clothes to fold go away. But at least you'll know that you're all in this together and you come by these feelings rightly. Okay. Chris, that's what I had. Did we miss anything? Is there anything you'd like to add? One thing I want to make sure folks are aware of is a video series that Northern Light Acadia Hospital did just a couple of years ago called Acadia Cares, the Child, Adolescent Resource and Educational Series. Those CARES videos, there are seven of them, can be found at northernlighthealth.org backslash Acadia Cares. And you will find videos there on anxiety, on youth suicide prevention, on bullying, including online bullying, on eating disorders and substance use, and more importantly, resiliency. You will find a video there on how we beef up kids' resiliency. I think those are great support. Each video is probably three or four minutes long. It will provide families and caregivers with some red flags, things to be on the lookout for, and some real concrete tools they could use to help move things forward and and access support for kids who may be struggling with any of those issues. I've watched some of those videos. They're excellent. Oh, thank you. The feedback we've gotten from families and from teachers and and educators has just been so positive. And it tells me that, you know, this series really hit the intended mark. We want to take the expertise that we and our team at Northern Medicaid Hospital have and get it out to anybody and everyone who could benefit from it. Chris says some of the sites to find more information and resources on this topic include NAMI Maine or NAMI Maine dot org slash teen text line, northernlighthealth.org slash Acadia Cares, and gearparentnetwork.org.